for the performance of this piece that I hope that you will find helpful. Uh, the first definitely has to do with the tempo. This is marked in an adagio, and you'll notice as you look through the etude, uh, the vast majority of the etude are, 16th, are comprised of 16th notes, but it starts off as quarter notes. So it can be challenging. Uh, you might be wanting to start the piece a little bit faster because it's quarter notes, but if you start too fast, the 16th notes are going to go blazing by and it's going to be challenging to execute. So make sure that you have a good idea about your 16th note speed before you start the quarter notes at the very beginning. So think about your 16th notes as 1 E and the 2 E and the, which is a good adagio speed. I'm going right around a uh, quarter note at 70, somewhere in there. Those quarter notes are going to seem really slow, but it's going to set up the tempo for the 16th notes really, really well. So just make sure that you don't start off too fast so that you can execute the 16th notes very well. Okay? I would definitely encourage the use of vibrato on all the long notes. That's especially true in the first four measures where, where you're playing all the half notes and the quarter notes. And there's some other long notes throughout, mainly at the ends of phrases, and I would encourage you to have some vibrato on there. Uh, to give you an example of what the vibrato, what it sounds like with vibrato or without, here's the first uh, two measures without vibrato. <laughs> Vibrato, in my opinion, definitely gives some more character and some more life to the way these notes sound. Uh, it's, a vi it's a jaw vibrato on the saxophone, and uh, if you don't know how to do vibrato, that's a little uh, more than what the scope of this video is here to teach you how to do. So if you have some questions about how to execute vibrato on saxophone, I'd encourage you to ask your band director or your private lesson teacher, but it's definitely a jaw vibrato. Another thing I'd like to bring up, just for as far as a fingering goes on this particular piece, if you look right before letter A, you have um, 30 second notes. You have a C and a D 30 second notes, and it goes right back to a C. Uh, I would encourage you to use the side key for D, the, the palm E flat key for the D, and hopefully you can see that. You're gonna be, already be on a C, and then to play D, leave your C key down, your, your middle finger on your left hand, and just hit the palm E flat with your index finger, just like you'd normally play, push the E flat key down, and that will give you the D. It's a tiny bit sharp, but it's within the realm of acceptability, and that's what people use for a trill fingering or a fast uh, between C and D fingering anyway. So I would not try to go I would not use long D. It's a little clunky and the tone quality changes too much between the C and the D for those notes being that close together. So, as opposed to using the, the long D fingering. So I would not use the long D fingering. Use that, again, it's a 
It's the C key down and then just hit that E flat key with your index finger and that'll get you to that D and right back. That's right before letter A. And you can keep that in mind too for a trill fingering. That's a great trill fingering. If you're trilling C to D or C sharp to D, that's, that's the way that you want to do it is with that side E flat key. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to, to bring up to you guys uh, is the articulation in this piece. Now I added a lot of slurs in this piece because if you'll notice, starting in bar five, all the way right up to, up to around letter B, there's a ton of slurs written in this piece. And then if you'll notice, starting the, the second bar of B, there's really no other slurs written for the entire piece. I think that this is done on purpose and they want you to continue the same style that you had in the first part of the piece. So rather than going, uh, playing it absolutely at face value, so here's what's actually written. I'm gonna tongue, start tonguing all the notes starting in the second and third bar of B. So here's how it's actually written. Letter B. Etc. Etc. I'm tonguing every note, legato tongue. You could do it that way if you want to take it absolutely at face value. I think that it should be done where you're adding in some slurs. So I'm typically doing slur two, tongue two, and all those groups of sixteenth notes. So here's B the way that I would prefer to do it. Slur two, tongue two. Right, as opposed to all tongue. I suppose you could do it either way. It's just, I'm taking a little bit of a subjective license there, and I like it better with the slur two, tongue two. I think it's a bit more saxophonistic, a little bit more idiomatic to the instrument, and I think it makes it sound a bit better too. Um, I also think that you could, and this would be a big could in capital letters, uh, right before the excerpt stops, this is letter D, one bar before D, two bars before D, on beat three, you have a C sharp dotted eighth note, and then the two quick B C sharp going to the D. You could add a trill there on that C sharp. I did not play one when you heard me play the whole excerpt, but you could add a trill there. Uh, I would leave that up to your own opinion as well, whether or not you wanted to do that. The way it's written is like this. I'm gonna start before D, one, two, three bars before D. This is without the trill, as written. That's the way that it's written. If you added the trill, it would sound this way. Which I think could sound nice also. Uh, of course, it depends on the judges you get that day and what they might or might not want to hear. So I would leave that up to you and you could uh, consult with your band director and your private lesson teacher if he or she thinks that that would be a good idea or not. I could go either way on it, but it would be maybe a neat thing to add in there, okay? A couple other small things. Crescendo wise, I would encourage you guys to look after letter C, one, two, three, four. I would start crescendoing each groups of those. We start doing what's called a sequence, which is basically the same melody that starts going up levels and pitch. So it's basically the same thing three times in a row. Again, after C, one, two, three, four, where you're starting on a C sharp. So you play that bar, the next bar a little bit louder, the next bar even a little bit louder than that. I'll play that for you so you can hear it. So each group of those gets a little bit louder, a little bit louder. It's a great way to build up some tension and some intensity. Another place where I would encourage you to do a crescendo because of a sequence is going back toward the beginning of the excerpt. This is after letter A. One, two, three, four, five, and six. We have a very similar thing to what we had after letter C. I'll play that for you starting third bar of A. <laughs> Each 
one of those could get a little bit louder. If you play it all the same level, it can be kind of flat and boring, but if you do a bit of a crescendo on those, it can really help um, bring up the intensity level quite a bit, okay? Regarding the bis key fingering for uh, B flat on this, there's a lot of places where I really could hear it going either way. I typically prefer to use the bis key anytime I have B flat, unless I have to go back and forth. If I have to slide back and forth. I'm not sure if you guys can see my hands there. If I have to slide back and forth between B and B flat, or A sharp, whatever you want to call it, that's not really very good technique 99% of the time. So if you ever had to do that, I would use one, two inside for the B flat fingering. Um, the rest of the time you use the bis key. If you don't have to slide, just use the bis key. So I'm using the bis key the, the vast majority of the time in this particular etude. Anytime I have a B flat, there are a couple of other times that I'm using uh, one, two inside for B flat. If I, have, if I come from a C, go to B flat and right back to C again. I use the side key, it's just a little, little bit cleaner fingering, but for a lot of the scale, a lot of the scale passages, I'm just using the bis key. Um, I think it's a really great fingering for B flat, and you are able to play it with only one finger instead of three. It's a very nice, efficient fingering for B flat. As a reminder, the limits of this etude are from the beginning, just up to the rest right before letter D. You don't have to play the four sixteenth notes right before letter D, just the beginning up to that rest before D. And uh, take your time on this one. It's a really beautiful melody with some uh, simple but not too simple technique, and it's a great way to show off some lyrical playing and some technique in this adagio movement of your etude. I hope you find my comments on this particular part of the uh, etude helpful, and if you have any questions about them, I certainly encourage you to contact me at aaron.linkton at sjsu.edu. <laughs>the second part of the Allstate Etudes for baritone saxophone from the Sonata Number no. 3 by Handel, arranged by Rasher, is the Allegro, and they want you to go from the beginning right up to the rest before letter B as in boy. Um, the challenging thing about this, obviously, is the uh, just the sheer amount of 16th notes in it and how quickly they move along. So it's marked at Allegro. Um, I, I wouldn't go too fast. I took, I took it at about 110 beats a minute for quarter note which I think is plenty fast, honestly. If you start getting up into the 120 range, uh, it can sound a bit frantic. So there's two primary things about this particular movement that I wanna to mention to you. One is the style of the 16th notes, and there's a couple of things here that I, that I wanna mention. The first is to keep the articulation very, very light. Um, you do not wanna to go too heavy on your tongue for the 16th notes, and you can hear that. I'll just do the first measure for you and I'll play it with a heavy tongue, and then I'll play it with a light tongue. It's almost like a slap tongue. You don't want it to sound like that. You're going too heavy on the tongue. So be very light on the tongue, let your air produce the sound, and let your tongue just make the notes clear. Let them articulate the notes. That's what articulate means, is what to make something clear. So all you want your tongue to do is just to make the rhythm of those 16th notes clear. It doesn't create the sound, it only helps define it. Too heavy, right? 
nice and light on those 16th notes throughout the entire movement. The other thing about the 16th notes is going to be the slurs. Uh, you may notice from listening to it, uh, I did this also in the first part of the uh, required etude in the adagio, that if you will notice, <clears throat> excuse me, right after the repeat sign on the third system halfway through, right after the repeat sign, we're marked slur two, tongue two. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. slur two, tongue two. And then, so, and then abruptly that marking stops. And it looks like you have to go, this is the fourth system, second measure. We have to tongue every note. You can do that if you want to take it totally at face value. I feel like that the word simile, which means similar in regards to articulations, that could have been written in that second measure on the fourth system. So all I'm doing is continuing the same style of articulation in that second measure of the fourth system. So slur two, tongue two. This is second measure, fourth system. I'll go really slow so you can hear it. Slur two, tongue two. Et cetera, et cetera, okay? And you know, you, you can ask, that's my opinion about how it should be interpreted. You could certainly ask your private lesson teacher or your band director if you want another opinion and see what he or she has to say about that, but that would be my encouragement for how you could, arti how you could articulate it. I think it's a lot more uh, idiomatic to saxophone articulation to do that. The uh, second thing to mention about this particular part of the excerpt is these repeated sections of 16th notes where you have the same 16th note pitch on top and a moving 16th note pitch on the bottom. This happens, this really starts to happen a lot right after that repeat sign on the third system. So what, what you want to be careful of there is to not make the upper notes, the notes that are repeated all the time, you don't want to make those too loud. Okay, you want to keep those a little softer and make the lower notes louder. So as an example, a correct way to play that first bar right after, right after the repeat. I'm giving accents to that, to that lower note. If I got rid of the, the top 16th notes and just played the notes on the downbeat. You want to bring out those lower notes, pull the top notes down. You don't want to go and play them all the same uh, dynamic level. It's a little, a little much, a little too intense, and it hides the melody that those lower notes create. If I were to play that, uh, uh, several bars of that, just um, emphasizing those lower notes, it would sound something like this. the 16th notes in there, uh, all the 16th notes, etc, etc. So I'm bringing out those lower 16th notes and kind of just bringing down a dynamic level a little bit the top 16th notes. So again, downbeats emphasized, the second, third, and fourth 16th note of each beat you can bring down somewhat. Those are my two main comments for this particular movement. I would say again, just to reiterate, don't go too fast. I know it says Allegro there. It can make you want to go maybe a little faster than you need to. Anywhere between like 108 and 112, I think is a really great tempo for this one because there's so many 16th notes. It's going to sound fast anyway. So you don't want to totally blaze it down and get yourself into a situation, especially when you're auditioning. There's a lot of adrenaline, might be a little nervous, whatever, and your fingers might just really just go, go off to the races and you'll find yourself in a bad situation. So keep the tempo a little more conservative than you think. And I assure you that because there's so many 16th notes in this movement, it's going to sound fast anyway. So, so don't go too fast. 108 to 112 is plenty. Keep the 16th notes really steady, very even. Keep your 16th, the tongued 16th notes light. Again, I would encourage adding the slurs on groups of 16th notes. You could tongue, or slur two, tongue two. Again, you could ask your private lesson teacher or your band director about their opinion on that, but that, that's what I would encourage. And other than that, good luck.
practice slow at first, build it up, don't be in a hurry to get to top tempo too quickly, make everything very, very even, take your time and it'll shorten the amount of time it takes you to learn the piece if you just go slow at first and each day build it up little by little by little. You have to have patience with yourself, be ready to spend some time on it, but it'll, it'll really help you out in the end if you take, take it easy when you're first learning the piece. So I wish you guys the best, best of luck in your auditions on this. And uh, if, I hope the comments that I had on the second part, the Allegro, are helpful for you. And if you have any questions about them, I encourage you to email me anytime at aaron.linkton at sjsu.edu. And you can also find any information about me and the department here if you just check out our webpage at the School of Music and Dance at San Jose State University. Thanks a lot and good luck to you.